Hello everyone. In the previous lecture, we were dealing with the history of Sanskrit poetics in the colonial period. We saw that the vigor with which new treatises on poetics was produced considerably dwindled during the colonial period. This did not mean that the Panditya or the scholarship in Sanskrit poetics vanished altogether. The scholarship in Sanskrit poetics continued to flourish, but the tendency of the previous period to critically examine the views of their predecessors or to present a radically new concept in poetics was conspicuously absent during this period. There were primarily two activities which characterized this period. The first one was the reconstruction of many treatises on Sanskrit poetics which were thought to be lost forever. We saw how Kuntaka Svakrokti Jivita which was thought forever, which was thought to be lost forever and known only through the references from other treatises were reconstructed from the available fragments. The second tendency was the dissemination of knowledge about Sanskrit poetics through the translation of these treatises on Sanskrit poetics from Sanskrit uh, to English and other vernacular languages. This facilitated the spread of knowledge about this knowledge system among the scholars who were not versed but interested in Sanskrit. In today's lecture, we are going to deal with an important tendency in the post-colonial phase which is the deliberation about the utility of Sanskrit poetics in the contemporary literary scenario. In the olden days, literature was considered a special form of language which could be created only after a careful and dedicated practice in Alankara Shastra or literary theory. In other words, Kavya vis was seen as a special use of language distinct from the ordinary form of speech. So, a dedicated practice was necessary to make Kavya appear distinct from the ordinary form of speech. But by the mid 20th century, a new conception about literariness under the influence of western critical theory and literature started taking deep root in the Indian subcontinent. This new approach tried to replicate the style and cadence of everyday speech in literary works and consequently stood in contrast to the formalistic notions about literature to which Sanskrit Kavishastra mostly conformed. In other words, the erstwhile conception that one needs to know the lessons of Sanskrit poetics before attempting to compose a literary work altogether disappeared. By this time, the literary world in India was also making a transition from Sanskrit to English and the vernacular languages which mostly embraced and championed this new conception of literature through new genres like novel, short story, autobiography, etc. So, there was also a strong feeling among many vernacular critics that the parameters of Sanskrit criticism were not adequate enough to judge and appreciate the new literary works founded on a new sense of literariness. Many literary critics in the vernacular literature often vehemently criticized the Sanskritic influence upon drama and sought for the employment of a new set of parameters for the appreciation and analysis of modern literary works which shared the style and sensibilities of everyday speech and life. What is happening during this period is actually a shift from the ontological idea of literature to a more liberal notion of literature. The ontological definition of literature believed that a literary work is different from other ordinary forms of language. So, this definition believed that if a piece of writing needs to be called a literature, it needs to be different from the ordinary form of speech. Now, especially with the emergence of newer forms of fiction such as the novel or short story, the idea of literature started looking more like everyday speech. The, this means two things here. First of all, one does not need any formal training to produce literature. It is often an endeavor solely on the basis of one's pradipha or creative genius. Secondly, since literature is not an ontological category, we do not need any specific set of parameters to judge the literary merit or quality of a literary work. 
This has also become a highly subjective endeavor. So, many literary critics argue that Sanskrit literary criticism does not have any relevance in the modern world. It cannot be used as a guidebook to produce literature, nor can it be used as a parameter to judge the literary merit of a modern literary work. Often, the situation is that if you try to judge the literary merit of a modern drama or short story, on the basis of the parameters of literariness set by Sanskrit Kavya, we may end up concluding that these modern works have no literary value. So, scholars like Sachidananda append that traditional critical frameworks are hopelessly inadequate to meet the needs of modern literature. According to him, this crisis, which is often unacknowledged, had already began with the maturing of Indian uh, languages. Like Sachidanandan, many critics such as Shivarudrapa, Ramlal Joshi, and Digish Mehta also express their reservations about the effectiveness of Sanskrit poetics in the uh, interpretation of modern literary works. They opine that Sanskrit literary theories pay little attention to the non-formalistic aspects of a work of art, which is a huge lacuna as far as a critical framework is concerned. Despite the general feeling that Sanskrit poetics is outdated to appreciate modern literary works, a group of critics during the 1980s attempted to apply Sanskrit Kavya Shastra to evaluate the merit of modern literary works from India. This shift, which can be labeled as a revivalist trend, was spearheaded by Indian literary theoreticians such as K. Krishnamurti, Krishna Rayan, Ayyappa Panikkar, C. D. Narasamhaya, and so on. The seminal event which inaugurated this movement was a seminar held at the Literary Criterion Center at Thunyaloka in Mysore on the theme of the formulation of a common poetics for Indian literature today. The seminar paid considerable attention to the practical use of Sanskrit poetics as a common critical framework to effectively understand and judge the literary merit of modern literary works in modern times. The conference concluded that the Rasathwani approach being the most dominant critical system in the Indian literary context could be used as a common critical framework to evaluate literary texts of Indian origin in modern times. The book The Burning Bush edited by Krishna Rayan was an, imme was an immediate output of this thought. This book analyzes 17 literary works from 17 different Indian languages through the lens of Rasa Thwani approach in order to understand the practical applicability of these theoretical positions in modern criticism. The blurb of the book says, with literature in the various Indian languages interacting more vigorously today than ever before, it has become all important that critical practice in them shares a common theoretical framework, so that the assumptions, analytical tools and evaluation criteria are roughly uniform. Obviously, there are major advantages in evolving this framework from existing Indian theory rather than sources elsewhere. The most widely dominant Indian critical system is the Rasathwani theory formulated in the 9th century. But before adopting it, it must be revised in the light of other Indian and Western theories and it must also be tested on the text in Indian languages. It is this latter that Krishna Rayan's book uh, seeks to do. Krishna Rayan's Rasathwani and present day literary theory and criticism, Ayyappa Panikkar's The Renovation of Rasa Theory, Krishna Murthy's The Relevance of Rasa Theory uh, in Modern Literature, R. B. Patnagar's Does the Rasa Theory Have Any Modern Relevance? Ma Shankar Joshi's The Relevance of Sanskrit Poetics to Contemporary Practical Criticism, etc., are some of the major works in this direction. All these critics opine that Sanskrit literary theory still has a relevance as a critical tool to appreciate and understand the literary merit of modern literary works, provided we modify these concepts according to the demands of the uh, modern time. In Rasa Thwani and present day literary theory and criticism, Krishna Rayan observes that Rasa Thwani's school in Sanskrit poetics has the potential 
to become a common theoretical framework for literary works in India. There are two reasons why he chooses Rasathi Dhwani approach as the critical framework for Indian literature. First of all, the use of Rasathwani approach helps us preserve our link with tradition and foster a sense of continuity. Secondly, the Rasathwani approach is more widely known than any other critical system and its concepts are in vogue in our arts and literatures. These two reasons, Ryan says, make a Rasathwani approach more capable than any other existing theory of serving us the basis of a common poetic tradition for Indian literature. He notes that while the Alamkara and Reedy school mechanically followed a manual of rhetoric and merely labeled, enumerated and classified stylistic devices using the methodology of a normative grammar, the Rasathwani theory critically examined the way the internal constituents of a literary work function to generate an aesthetic response from Sahardayas. He also points out that the affinity of Rasathwani theory with the assumptions and conclusions of contemporary Euro-American uh, literary theories give it a considerable degree of contemporary relevance. However, he notes that the Rasathwani uh, theory has a lot of lacunas in the contemporary literary scenario. So, he says that this theoretical position needs to be realigned, revised and added to with a reference to the broad movements in literature and literary theory since the 11th century. Ryan holds that the Rasathwani theory if enlarged and modified in this line uh, can well serve as a common theoretical framework for literary criticism in Indian languages. In the essay, The Renovation of Rasa Theory, K. Ayyappa Panikar opines that Sanskrit literary theories in their present form are not suitable as a critical framework to read modern literary texts and we need to incapacitate them by synthesizing them with modern critical theories. He talks about the importance of developing an Indian theoretical framework or concept by modifying Sanskrit literary theories, especially Rasa theory in the light of modern critical positions to interpret both Indian and non-Indian literary works. According to him, since Rasa theory which was originally developed, uh, apl uh, developed and applied to dramaturgy can be extended to poetry uh, and modern works of art. So, this is there is no problem in that. So, he is also asking for a revision. In his article, Does Rasa Theory Have Any Modern Relevance? R. B. Patnagar criticizes both the Indian critics who are totally ignorant of the literary thought in the pre-modern period and who find that only western critical framework is adequate to their purpose and the Sanskrits, uh, Sanskritists who think that Sanskrit literary theories are not supposed to be put to mundane uses like analysis and evolution of modern literary works, even of works produced in Indian languages. He opines that the Sanskrit literary theories as a critical framework still have relevance in modern world, citing the reason that a whole lot of interfaces can be identified between Sanskrit literary theories and the western literary theories of the modern times. However, he opines that while owing allegiance to ancient scholars, the modern scholars of Sanskrit studies should also realize that it is necessary to modify ancient theories. In short, the conclusion of his enquiry into the ability of Sanskrit literary theories as a critical framework is that they have the potential to become a critical framework in modern times also, but they need to be modified and aligned, realigned. Many post-colonial critics opine that this tendency in the first instance was the result of a strong desire to decolonize Western critical sensibilities and to reconstitute a sense of Indianness of the text considered and assess their virtue by the standards and assumptions of indigenous aesthetics. Bill Ashcroft et al. talk about this tendency in literary criticism in their empire rights back. They say, Indian scholars and critics have been logged in debates as to how far these traditions can be adapted to the needs of modern criticism for Indian literature. 
The debate centers on whether or not the highly sophisticated theories propounded by the Sanskrit schoolmen can be or indeed ever uh, were applied in the evaluation of works of art. Uh, and more specifically, whether the terms of this tradition Rasa, Thwani, Alankara, etc. are more relevant and suitable than imported terms to the description of contemporary literatures in the Indian vernacular languages and to a lesser extent to Indian literatures in English. Although it is important to record how classical knowledge systems were originally understood and practiced, an obsession with this process in the realm of research uh, will only impede new course of development in this field. What we need is an interventionist historiography of ideas which will critically examine these theoretical positions from different vantage points and will prevent them from becoming static categories. Each new reading of a text dislodges it from our taken for granted conceptions about it and leads us to the production of new knowledge about that text. This is the only way in which we can ensure the continuity of the existing framework of ideas. This attempt to go beyond the borders of the received notions about an epistemology is the very life force of any knowledge system, be it ancient or modern. It not only prevents an intellectual tradition from becoming ossified in nature, but also ensures the continuum of knowledge. As far as the Indian Kavishasa tradition is concerned, attempts to step beyond the existing truth claims was its very life force. In many Kavishastra texts, we can see authors employing what is known as the Purva Paksha strategy, wherein an author explains the view of his predecessor or contemporary and then refutes it systematically in order to register their dissent with the opinion of their predecessors or contemporaries so as to establish their own positions. We have already seen in the uh, previous lecture of the study that Guna and Rithi critical frameworks were the outputs of dissent with the views of Phalankarikas. Thwani was the result of dissent with the view of uh, the exponents of Guna and Rithi. And the Anumana school had considerable differences of opinion with the exponents of Thwani school. When it comes to the medieval phase, Navyas or the neo intellectuals in Kavi Shastra subjected the views of their predecessors to careful scrutiny and criticism, as we find it in the works of uh, Siddhajandra's Kavya Prakasha Khandana or Jagannatha's Chitra Mimamsa Khandana. So, what we need to do here is that. Instead of repeating the same old paradigms over and over again, we definitely need to go beyond the available scholarship to explore newer possibilities of this field. I hope you have understood this lesson. Thank you.